Crave was conceived as a way to deliver our strong educational mission and our membership's desire for their continued learning. Through the Crave series, our chapter will deliver webinars and virtual meetings to deliver timely and relevant topics that are affecting our industry today. It's about the effort that we uh, expend to connect with people. But you have an opportunity to see people, you have an opportunity to chat with people. We may not have an opportunity to have appetizers and share, share a drink with each other, but we stay connected. And that's the really the most important thing. Being able to work together and learn together in a new format, um, a new environment, really helped us take those pre-existing relationships and friendships that I had to another level. Cornet has taken the leadership in these kinds of conversations for years and years, and so we're, we're delighted to have this long-term relationship with Cornet. I found the Cornet to be a, a great community of dedicated real estate professionals, and what it means to me is it gives me a wider network of people with whom to share ideas, to uh, derive the best learnings, to uh, test and experiment with things that I'm working on. This program is all about personal growth and becoming the leader that you want to be. Cornet has always led the way when it comes to supporting the professional development of our members. Our roundtable discussions, our education workshops, and our professional development programs are just part of what makes Cornet so valuable to our members. It was critical for us to find a way to still be able to facilitate all of this. Crave has provided us the platform to be just as effective and to still provide that value to our members in a virtual environment. Cornet not only provides a platform for different groups to come together regardless where you come from in terms of organization, but really, really help each member to feel like they belong in this organization. We have a diverse membership base and you will find that members come from all walks of life and from all over the world. However, it's still an area of focus for us to improve upon and to embrace equity, inclusion, and diversity through increasing awareness and taking action, as we know this will lead to more success for the organization and for our members. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for today's Crave session. Um, how science and data are helping organizations return to a new normal. I uh, just wanted to run through a couple slides first before we jump in. Um, as always, here's a list of our upcoming Cornet New England virtual events. Um, be sure to check out our website and the Monday morning chapter newsletter letter to register for some of these events. Um, as always, you can uh, engage with us on social media and help share the Cornet New England story through Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we want to thank our uh, sponsors for their generous support of the chapter. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to provide our members with these valuable content, such as today's presentation. So. Thank you to our corporate, uh, our corporate sponsors, our platinum sponsors, and also our gold and silver sponsors. Uh, before we dive in, um, please note that you can submit questions to Michael, our presenter, at any time through the Q&A box uh, in Zoom. 
Um, I'll be monitoring the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Uh, so um, just note that today's session is being recorded and brought to you by uh, Cornet Global's New England chapter. Um, how science and data are helping organizations return to a new normal. <clears throat> Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Gao, a co-founder of Haven Diagnostics, whose primary goal is helping employers manage operational risk and return to work strategies using scientific and analytical approaches. Michael is an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell and has extensive experience clinically as a hospital medicine physician. He's also widely recognized as a leader in applied artificial intelligence uh, as the formal, former medical director for transformation at New York Presbyterian Hospital. He was also a Silverman Fellow in Healthcare Innovation at New York Presbyterian. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Michael. Very excited to have you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Steve. And um, it's great to meet everybody virtually um, during this time. And thank you all for hopping on what I'm sure is yet another Zoom meeting. And, and hopefully this one will be, um, will be at least fairly interesting. Um, and as Steve mentioned, the main topic for discussion today is office safety in the context of infectious disease and specifically how to think about keeping risk um, in your work setting low besides just shutting down and having everybody out of the office, which is certainly one option. Um, and as uh, Steve mentioned, I, we, we do have a relatively unique perspective to share. Um, my experience, as you all heard, is both clinical and taking care of patients, including COVID patients in the hospital. I'm a physician right in New York City. Um, and then uh, the other co-founder, Josh, has um, is also a physician, um, but has more of a research perspective being funded by the Department of Defense and the NIH. Um, so together it's about bringing clinical experience, research experience and operational experience together. And actually prior to COVID, Josh and I were both working operationally in the hospital, thinking about how to mitigate infectious disease risk in that particular environment which as you might imagine is both high risk for transmitting any number of diseases and also cannot just be um, shut down. So actually, and Debbie, maybe you could pull up the first, um, the first polling question. I'm a little bit curious about for this audience, um, you know, what your company's plan for returning to the office is, whether you're already fully back, whether you want to return and you're trying to increase the number, whether you kind of want to return, but it would be nice to have people and it'd be nice to have people in the office, whether you don't need to return and don't particularly, you know, see a point in returning until there's herd immunity, or lastly, whether you plan to stay fully virtual. Um, I will say if everybody responds with the last one and just planning on staying fully virtual for the rest of all time, then this presentation can be relatively short. All right. So it looks like um, from the response, and thank you all for replying, that, um, and this is what we've been seeing in the market as well, most people um, you know, are functioning reasonably well in the virtual setting and are kind of divided between we can be quite conservative about our approach or we're being conservative, but it would be nice not to wait until 2022. And then a handful of people see more value in the office itself. And uh, very few people are thinking that a purely virtual environment is going to be um, feasible in the long term. So thank you all for replying to, to that poll question. So for the people who answered um, uh, number four, which is, uh, you know, we don't need to return and we want to wait until there's herd immunity or we don't need to return and herd immunity would be nice. Um, I think one of the questions that we've seen is when is herd immunity? 
And remember back in March of last year, uh, I think many people thought that it would be over by the summer and then by Labor Day and then by New Year's. And so, you know, now there's a question of how quickly can we vaccinate 70 to 80% of the population. Um, and the challenge that we are going to face is early on today, it's about the number of doses that are available about manufacturing. But as we move forward through the next quarter or two quarters, at some point in time, it will transition to being demand limited rather than supply limited. And the thing that I think everybody is a little bit worried about is that, you know, up to half of Americans, more in some states, uh, fewer in other states, are, you know, willing to get the vaccine, but the other half are still skeptical. And a portion of those have, at least as of today, already committed to not getting the vaccine. Um, so I don't know how many people here have seen the play Waiting for Godot, but the main character Godot in the play literally never arrives. And so all of the other characters in the play wait forever um, for this character to, to arrive. And I think similarly, the question is, you know, is waiting for 0% risk kind of a waiting for Godot strategy where it will never quite reach zero. And that's the bad news, which is that I doubt that there is a day um, within the year 2021 in which the risk of coronavirus truly reaches 0%. However, the flip side of that is that the choices are not just 100% risk or 0% risk, right? And the gradient of risk naturally depends on the frequency of disease in the population amongst uh, several other things. And so as the vaccine is being deployed to the public, I would suspect, um, and this is given what we know about the strain so far, um, although of course the future is hard to predict, I would suspect that by um, late spring and early summer, even if we have not reached herd immunity, large outbreaks like what we've seen this winter will be increasingly unlikely. And then I think by September and certainly by winter of next year, we might see little bumps, um, but what we'll kind of see is embers of disease, um, you know, sprouting up here and there across the country rather than sustained transmission in all communities. Um, as to when coronavirus will become literally zero risk, I mean, that's impossible to predict. There's still, as all of you know, occasional measles outbreaks in California, um, even though that vaccine came out in 1971. So, um, you know, that concept that risk doesn't, isn't just 0% or 100%, but rather that it's a gradient that, you know, goes kind of in a smooth fashion from what we see as risk today to minimal and tolerable risk um, is something that doesn't just apply to immunity, but it applies to everything. And for the people who are um, essentially waiting for herd immunity or waiting for the right time to go back into the office, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing is we're taking this gradual improvement and we're trying to convert that into a stepwise decision um, from not okay uh, today to okay tomorrow and trying to figure out when that transition um, occurs. And so that I should mention though, that just like um, immunity risk uh, isn't the same in every state, the actual risk of transmission in the office isn't the same in every office either. And we'll talk a little bit about how different factors within the office um, can change your specific office's risk of transmission. And, you know, it's, it's something that I think this concept that different places have different risk, I think, has been something that we have 
not always done a good job of um, discussing as a society. And I think some of that relates to, um, you know, a lot of the early headlines in the disease. So I still remember back in March and April, the streets of New York City were completely empty. Um, every single patient on my list in the hospital was a COVID patient. The sort of, you know, news at the time was that the virus would survive on surfaces for two days, three days. Um, the most I found was 28 days. And if you think about it conceptually, um, again, putting yourself in the shoes back in March and April, when I was also wiping down vegetables before putting them um, in the fridge, if you think about it conceptually, a virus that can stay suspended in air for hours and can stay you know, contaminating a surface for, for weeks at a time would be so contagious that there really would be no such thing as safer environments and more dangerous environments. Um, you would basically be exposed to live virus the minute you left your, um, you know, your home. Um, and maybe even at home, if you're living in an apartment building, there would be a virus that would be coming through the vents. And so the good thing is now we know better. And um, I'm curious though, a little bit, how much of, uh, if, if kind of cognitively we understand the proportions uh, correctly. And so Debbie, if you don't mind pulling up the second question, um, the question is how much more virus can be transmitted, you know, is transmitted by air versus contact. And I, by contact, I don't mean, you know, I'm spitting onto your hand and, you know, we, we do a, a handshake deal that way. By contact, I mean, you're touching a doorknob or a desk surface that somebody was at earlier. And the question is, of the transmission we've seen so far, what would we say the proportions are? So A is about the same, B is more by air, C is 90% by air, and most people answered C, uh, which is about 90% by air, 10% by contact. And it's a really good guess. The actual correct answer is answer D, which is that it is basically all by air. And um, I, there have been maybe a handful of cases worldwide that have been even somewhat persuasively linked to that kind of indirect doorknob or desk contact transmission. Um, and, you know, I think it's, important because you know when we are thinking about the policies and procedures and where we're investing not just our money but our cognitive energy um, in terms of reducing risk knowing how each individual factor plays into risk is is highly critical and if you recall um, early in the course of the disease what we saw was that there were lots of super spreading events occurring in bars and restaurants. There is that, you know, Korean call center, meat packing plants and choirs. Um, and there was not a lot of super spreading events seen at offices and movie theaters. And, you know, I, I think there was that article with groups of people gathering outside in the Ozarks and it turns out, you know, we we're all super scared that there would be a huge amount of spread there. And there actually wasn't as much as um, anticipated. And so, again, this is incompatible with the concept of a virus that lives on surfaces for weeks and hangs out in the air for days. If that were the case, then all environments would have seen, you know, uh, super spreading events. And if you think about it, people are spending much, much more time in offices than they're spending, um, you know, in their Sunday morning choir. And so we saw weddings, but not movie theaters. Um, and this goes back to that point about contact, where in a wedding, there's a lot of singing, a lot of dancing and a lot of talking. And the talking at nature of the wedding releases a lot more aerosol and droplet. Whereas in a movie theater, it's primarily focused uh, on not talking and watching a movie. 
And therefore, most of the spread in a movie theater would occur by contact. And so we saw lots of super spreading events at weddings, but even before they shut down, not a lot at movies. Um, and in the hospital, we saw a similar pattern, which is that when we looked at where hospital spread occurred, um, you can imagine, of course, the waiting room is one area, the emergency department in New York City, not everybody can get their own room and kind of an open bay is another. But for where physicians and nurses were working and with shared desks in a you know, closed room, hospital buildings in New York are quite old. And so, you know, with, with uh, sort of limited ventilation, we actually um, did not see very much spread, which is really great news. And so the way to think about COVID risk um, is not, am I going to be exposed to the virus? Yes or no. And is there a chance of me being exposed to the virus? But really to think about the different activities and policies and behaviors that impact the quantity of aerosol and droplet from COVID exhaled into the environment, and then the quantity of COVID um, taken in from the environment. And each of your actions can, of course, impact this quantity. So, you know, would I drive down the freeway at night with my lights off um, and no seatbelt? Absolutely not. Um, but would I drive my car, um, you know, relatively safely with a seatbelt, with lights on, you know, not texting? Yes, I would. Um, and so even though no car ride is perfectly safe, there is a threshold past which I think we consider the risk to be reasonable and a threshold past which we consider the risk to be foolish. And so what we've seen is um, that uh, airborne transmission occurs more than 100 times more than surface transmission. Um, what is less commonly known is that when you're speaking, you release about 30 times more aerosol and droplet than when you're breathing. And just for you to imagine that visually in your head, what I'm saying is that one person in a room speaking and giving a presentation, so myself, is releasing the same amount of aerosol and droplet as the um, every participant, well, you know, depending on how many participants on this call. So you can have 30 people packed into a room, breathing and working quietly, and that's equivalent in risk. And so offices that are quiet, where people are just sort of doing a little bit of work, typing away, are orders of, you know, probably an order of magnitude um, lower risk than a restaurant environment with a same, with a similar density, but where the primary function of that environment is talking or speaking out loud. Um, does not apply, of course, to call centers where the primary function there is speaking. The other thing I would note with respect to policies and procedures and behaviors is that no strain of the virus, at least as of today, has yet learned how to read. And so therefore the virus does not, of course, follow CDC guidelines. And so when you're thinking about the six foot rule, as an example, it's not a law of nature that's been you know, written by a, a god or, or a supernatural being. It's a probabilistic statement where we've looked at studies about aerosols and droplets decreasing over time. And uh, you know, on average by six feet, we think the risk um, has declined exponentially from, uh, uh, or I guess logarithmically from where it was um, in a, at a closer distance. And so the important thing here is that um, as an example, there's, you know, offices which have constructed elaborate one-way arrows to prevent people from, you know, passing within six feet of each other, um, you know, even, even for seconds. And the result of that maze is a person who's spending much more time walking through the office and breathing into the office environment. And you've actually created a scenario in which 
the increased amount of time and your breathing rate is faster when you're walking compared to when you're sitting, the increased aerosol and droplet um, exhalation has more than counteracted um, any benefit to risk from just not passing quietly by somebody in the office setting. And uh, we talked about how exposure is not a binary event. This is true both because the amount of virus you're exposed to affects the likelihood that you get the disease, but the early data suggests that the amount of virus you get also affects the severity of um, the disease. And it's, it's statistical, right? So I'm not saying that if you get lower exposure, you can't get really sick or be hospitalized or, um, you know, it can't be fatal, but just that the chance that those things occur is, um, is lower as a result. And so back before medical ethics was um, invented, we know from the flu, you know, researchers sprayed different volunteers, and I, I say that with air quotes, with different doses of the flu virus and found that people who were sprayed with high doses of the flu got things like pneumonia and, you know, changes on their chest x-ray and people who were sprayed with very low doses were more asymptomatic. And uh, again, the early data suggests that that may be true for COVID as well. And so what essentially to summarize the early points, um, risk of an environment can be modified. And we've talked about some things like the behavior and whether people are speaking um, or working quietly. Um, and when you add many things together, the risk difference between environments can vary actually pretty greatly. And what we have been doing, uh, you know, from, from a research perspective, but also as a company, is to create computational models of many different types of office environments um, and actually custom computational models to help specific companies understand, well, you know, how, what about this policy in my office specifically rather than just generally? And I think a lot of people think, okay, when we apply good policies and procedures in the office, we can lower risk by a little bit. And so uh, this graph, this is proportionally correct, by the way, shows the transmission risk of COVID in a restaurant versus an office without policies and procedures. And this is one hour in a restaurant versus eight hours in the office. So you can already see that office risk is significantly lower than restaurant risk, especially on a per hour basis. And I think some people think, okay, great. If we implement some policies and procedures, we've decreased that risk by 20%. It's actually, um, depending on what you're able to implement and your office layout, something more like 20 fold. So it's the same as, you know, the difference in the rate of COVID between, uh, you know, December and September when it was um, at relatively low levels in the community. So it's a drastically um, lower risk in the office environment that can be achieved. And it's not, in terms of the environment, of course, it's not just speech and volume, it's ventilation and filtration, time, density, volume of space, testing, um, whether you are asking employees to be vaccinated and policies around that um, and uh, you know, whether uh, they're screened before they're coming in and fluidity of movement. And you'll note that again, because contact is such a small proportion of risk, um, I'm not saying don't clean your doorknobs or, you know, bathrooms or common surfaces, but deep cleaning the entire office, um, especially deep cleaning at the end of an office day where a virus has an entire evening or an entire weekend to deteriorate and not become live anymore um, is something that can help employee comfort, um, but probably does not change the risk of transmission by that much.
if any. And so when, when we talk about that 20x difference between different spaces, um, this, what we're really saying is that by stacking these policies together, face masks, meeting policies, sick leave, and other things, you're taking things that each individually might affect risk by 50%, by 60 or 70%, but that when you add it together, the cascaded effect is to actually create a total environment that is significantly safer. Um, our clients have had probably somewhere on the order of now 240,000 days in the office. Screening with asymptomatic cases isn't perfect. Um, so people have definitely come to the office with COVID. But despite that, there's only been um, two maybe cases of in-office transmission. Um, and every other case was pretty definitively not in the office. And Michael. The third principle, go ahead, Steve. We do have a question just about the, the known and you know the new variants mm -hmm. and any potential new variants that we don't know about yet and the risk yep. associated with that. Absolutely. So um, I, I'm sure everybody has knows this from the news, but the big relevant new variants that we're um, seeing as, as a society are the UK variant, um, the South African variant, and the Brazilian variant. Um, so what I will say is what's, what's pretty definitively known is that the mechanism of spread in these new variants seems to be the same. Meaning it's not that the B117 strain suddenly transmits, you know, by contacts rather than by aerosol and droplet. So the things that you're doing to reduce risk still proportionally reduce risk a similar amount. The infectiousness of the variant um, may be different. And so the studies around the B117 strain, as an example, do suggest that it is 50 to 60% more infectious. And what that means is, you know, if previously a one hour meeting with somebody who had the virus means that you have a 7% chance of being infected, now that same hour meeting at the same distance with the same policies and procedures means that there's, you know, an 11% chance of being infected. Um, mortality around the new strains is um, still very much to be determined. There's lots of small studies that show, because they're small studies, different results. Um, but I would be, I would expect mortality to be somewhere on the order of 20 or 30% more. Um, I would be very surprised if it were you know, 70 to 80% more. And I really genuinely do not think it's something like 10 times more as an example. So the difference between COVID and the flu, um, funnily limited because of our lack of understanding of the flu is probably depending on your age, somewhere around the order of a 20 fold difference in mortality. Um, and that's you know, it's not going to be another 20 fold with the new strain of COVID. What that means for, if you remember that early graph in the presentation, um, waiting for Godot, I will try to scroll back. Um, had I known it was this far back, I would not have tried scrolling. Um, but what that means is that the, um, this graph would essentially be stretched out. Um, and uh, if the vaccine isn't as efficacious and as you know, more people are getting the disease, um, you know, I would expect maybe instead of May when local outbreaks become unlikely, it's now July, maybe instead of September when herd immunity is reached, um, you know, it's now January or February of next year. Um, the virus is mutating quickly enough such that when it's um, in hundreds of millions of people at a time, new strains are developing as we're seeing um, from our evidence today. 
But you do have to remember that when it's in 100 million people, that means that it has 100 million separate chances of developing a new strain. And if it's in 10 people, it only has 10 chances of developing a new strain. And so, you know, if three new strains have developed over the course of a year, three significant new strains in 100 million people, and we can get that infection rate down to 10 million, well, it would take 10 years to develop, you know, that new strain. If we get it down to, you know, a few thousand people, kind of, you know, an embering set of cases here and there, a new strain may well never develop. Um, so now I will jump back forward, if you'll have to excuse me. So we talked about all of the different things that can be, um, you know, that can reduce risk. And I think one of the dominant questions that we all have today is, great, I know I can reduce risk if I allow everybody back in the office and each person gets a private office and we lock them in and they're not allowed to talk to anybody else and they you know, wear a face mask by their computer in the private office. The problem with doing that is of course that the office itself um, is not appealing to go back to. Um, and so the question becomes, well, you know, how do we create an office that does allow for some collaboration um, and does allow for the office environment to be somewhat um, you know, meaningful while still keeping risk relatively low. And so uh, you know, what I'm showing here is three different office environments. Up at the top is more of a traditional environment in which um, you, know, you have open floor seating and then you have sets of meeting or collaboration rooms, uh, you know, uh, close by. Um, and then two different plans, one for uh, much more collaboration. You can see with the desks, the purple area to the right, um, the setup of the desks and the space in the right, um, and lower density in terms of the workspace. And then a third uh, configuration which is almost all collaboration. And what's important to note here is what we've modeled for this particular client is that the top graphic would have about one hour of collaboration a day. The middle graphic would have about two and a half hours of collaboration. Um, and the bottom one would have five hours of collaboration a day. And blue is the top, red is the middle, green is the right. So to no surprise, more collaboration does result in more exposure. But what was surprising is that what we're not seeing is it's not that with five hours of collaboration instead of one hour, it's not that we're seeing exposure go from, you know, increased by fivefold, right? It's increasing by significantly less than that. And so for this particular um, client, uh, what they set up as a strategy was, you know, they went from every day in the office in this top space to, uh, you know, once or twice per week in the office in this middle space. And even though their risk of, you know, infection a little bit was a little bit higher because they were only there for one or two days a week, their actual total exposure was much, much lower. So meaning, you know, Tuesday through Friday, the employee is getting zero risk and that more than balances things out, it actually decreases things um, below the total exposure in the other scenarios. And it's still allowed for teams to get um, adequate in-person collaboration. Um, and I want to talk about, I think everybody now has heard about MER filtration and ventilation, you know, and, and all of those things, I did want to address a couple things that may not have been um, spoken about as much. The first is plume direction. So it's not just about being diagonal and the distance that people are away from each other, um, but it's about the direction that people are facing. And naturally, if, you know, two of us are sitting in a room talking 
and we were sitting just for extreme purposes back to back there would be no direct droplets that are flying from one of us to the other person. And the only transmission that would occur would be by kind of clouds of aerosol that would build up. And it's those kind of clouds of aerosols that the um, ventilation system is most effective at decreasing. The second is thinking about the supply and return vents. And specifically, um, what you want is for there to be what we call laminar flow. So uh, essentially, airflow that is um, you know, not resulting in a ton of mixture and different placements of supply and return vents relative to the desks will have smoother airflow, which means that any COVID aerosols in the air are getting kind of smoothly carried to the return vent where it has an opportunity to be filtered out. Conversely, in some other setups, supply and return vent results in turbulent flow, kind of like if you're shaking a martini and the um, you know, droplets and aerosols are being spread in an unpredictable fashion through the entire space. The downside of laminar flow, of course, is that um, a droplet can be carried for a pretty significant distance. So that is one additional area to be careful of. And then, um, you know, when people ask what policies and procedures they should have when coming back to the office, the answer to that depends on your building, your layout, and a lot of these physical structures. So everybody intuitively agrees and understands that the policies and procedures we have in the hospital are not things that you should apply directly to the office, because of course the hospital is a much higher risk environment than the office environment. Similarly, policies you might have if your office were predominantly call center based should not be the same policies and procedures that apply to a law firm with all private offices. The date of which you re when you reopen, is it September 1st, is it October 1st, you know, is it July 1st, shouldn't be the same between those two configurations as well. And based on your needs, it's possible to actually choose essentially a combination of best practices that allows you to do what you need to do while still maintaining a low risk environment. So the, the knobs you can kind of turn are office layout, um, how long you wait and behaviors and policies. And you kind of need to turn all of them such that you achieve um, some threshold of safety. And we do, and then, um, oh, go ahead. We do have just a couple of questions about sure. just ma wearing masks best practices, you know, do you have yeah. to wear a mask all day in every scenario or, or what does that look like? Yeah, so earlier in the presentation, we talked about how, um, how there are different activities like speaking that results in 30 to 50 X more droplets and aerosols being generated than when sitting quietly. And so if you were to wear a mask during a one hour meeting where you're doing a lot of talking, it has a huge effect. Um, if you're wearing a mask while you're, you know, if you're sitting at your desk quietly writing notes, um, it has a relatively minimal effect on overall risk. The best policies that we've seen generally say, wear a mask um, when you have some chance of interacting with another person. And specifically where people are often not wearing masks, but they should be is when they're, you know, stopping by another office. So, you know, maybe Steve and I are working in offices next to each other. I have a quick question and I'm popping over and talking to Steve. It's tempting to think, great, I'm only gonna be, you know, we're only gonna be talking for two minutes. I'll ask him how the kids are and then I'll go back to my desk, but, the reality is because there's a lot of talking, that two minutes is equivalent multiplied by 30 to an hour of us sitting next to each other working quietly. So 
what I would say is wear masks whenever you think there's a chance you'll interact with another person, which generally means, um, you know, in public areas, break rooms, especially focused on meetings. Um, we talked about how the, if the virus doesn't know whether it's at six feet, one inch or five feet, 11 inches as it's flying through the air. So even if your conference rooms are set up such that everybody's six feet apart, it's still important to wear masks during that setting. Great. And um, one of the other things, you know, I think, uh, again, you know, this depends a little bit on the office itself. So we talked about how if you're a call center and everybody's job is literally to talk all day, then it is hard to wear masks as a call center employee. And so you really need to figure out how to balance um, density and job function um, and return to the office. The other thing I'll note is that herd immunity is not just a single number. So I think a lot of people have asked, well, when is herd immunity? I've heard 60%, 70%, you know, 80%, you know, which one is it? What I would say is herd immunity depends. There's no magic number. It doesn't depend on the, it depends a little bit on the virus, but it depends on the population itself. So if you imagine a string of interactions that was like a string of Christmas lights. So one person only talks to two other people, one person that they spoke with yesterday and one person that they'll speak with tomorrow. Just like Christmas lights, if there's a break at any point in those interactions, the entire rest of the chain would not be infected and would not light up. And so herd immunity for a population in which interactions were like a stream would be very, very low because, you know, at any point in time, if the virus stops, everybody else would be safe. Conversely, if everybody were in a room, you know, if a hundred people were in a room locked in together and sharing resources and talking to each other, then as long as there is one person infected in the room and one person not infected in the room, there's a good chance that that transmission happens. So herd immunity in that setting would be closer to 98 or 99%. So how your office is structured, how your community is structured changes what herd immunity actually is. Um, and so that itself is different office by office. So even if your plan was, I'll wait until 75% herd immunity, well, 75% may or may not be um, the correct number for you. And the last part I'll talk about in the past, in the last few minutes is just thinking about preparedness for the future. And I'm a little bit curious, and Debbie, this is the last question, I believe, if the discussion about, not just about whether, um, you know, this has happened today, but whether it'll happen in the future, if, uh, you know, relevant to your planning, I'm a little bit curious if that's occurred. And it's totally okay, by the way, if the answer is no, um, because we just have been so slammed and we're just trying to get to tomorrow. So the options are, we're actively thinking about it. Um, we haven't really had time to think about it, but I accept it as a possibility. Shouldn't this be a once in a century thing? I don't really expect seeing this again. And no, not really. All right, wow. That's, that's um, interesting and surprising to hear, which is that a lot of you seem to be ahead of uh, at least your peers in terms of, yes, we are um, actively thinking about diseases and cases like this in the future. So, um, you know, and the rest are a uh, great job, um, you know, but for very reasonable things you're worried about today. So, what I will say is that um, the framework that we've spoken about applies to many pandemics that occur um, on a yearly basis. So the flu and the cold and diseases that seemed so distant in 2002, um, you know, like SARS with the retroscope on feel like, wow, we actually, maybe we we're just lucky that SARS, the original SARS, um, didn't hit our shores. 
the good news is that a lot of the investments that many of you may be making in terms of outside air intake, um, education for your employees, thinking about configuration of space is not just effective for COVID today, but actually highlighted in yellow, effective for a bunch of potential pandemics that um, have occurred in the last 20 years. So I, I do think that they are truly investments in employee health, in addition to being something that is um, important during times of COVID. Um, what I will say about Ebola and Zika is that parent, you know, the kind of aerosol and droplet as a focused paradigm doesn't apply as much to those diseases, um, but that those types of diseases typically, you know, mosquito-borne as an example, arise much more in a tropical environment. So, you know, malaria would be another example of a tropical pandemic that has similar patterns of transmission to Zika. Um, and so I think, you know, this is the Northeast, I think, chapter, um, certainly. So if not New England chapter, so I think very few of us need mosquito nets for a sustained period of time. And the last piece that I will say is, and I think we're all, um, you know, I think intuitively understanding this, that there's improved behaviors uh, that I think all of us have personally undertaken and that we've educated employees on. There's improvements that are made to the environment. Um, and those things only matter, well, they matter, but they matter most in the context of good communication, both to employees and to management. And I think it's important um, for companies to make sure that all of senior management is on the same page. We've occasionally seen companies where there's a couple people within senior management that think we've implemented all the policies, so we're okay to be back 100%. A few people who disagree strongly and say, you know, how could we not care about employee health? We should have nobody in the office and a lot of people in the middle. Um, and so getting everybody on the same page is important. And then making sure that employees understand not that they should be forced into the office, but the safety and the risks of the office relative to other things that they're experiencing on a day to day basis helps those employees. So you know, we've all had known people and maybe some of you on this call are people who've, you know, been traumatized from COVID and had close friends or family members or even your own self that's been very seriously affected. And I would never tell somebody who's, you know, really quarantining at home and, you know, really preventing any exposure that they have to come back to the office. But I would tell somebody who's, going to restaurants and meeting with groups of friends and worried about the office, that they're not being internally consistent. That if they're okay with those levels of risks, that office risk is actually significantly lower and that they should think about having a set of personal behaviors that is consistent across the board. Um, and so absolutely communication is really critical. So that was the last slide and I, I thank all of you for your time and I think we have um, time for at least an additional couple questions. Thanks, Michael, very informative. Um, do have a couple of questions out there that I wanted to save um, till the end, but one of them is just around perception versus reality, right? So I think that the data, the science is really great, but what would you say about um, some of the folks who just misinformation or perception out there? How, what are best practices around educating, uh, education, yeah, or even yeah. other ideas to, to break down that barrier? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we've seen a lot of is linking to, say, the updated CDC website um, that says, you know, I mean, the CDC uses very conservative language. So it says, I think it says something like contact is thought to be a less common way of spread. Um, not, you know, obviously we provide services, but I've seen some companies in which they've partnered with a physician or, um, you know, somebody else that, uh, with kind of credentials, for lack of a better word, 
um, to essentially help communicate the current knowledge of disease to, um, to their employees. And the only thing is there, I would say, you know, Stephen, you and I could say the same words. It just does occasionally sound more convincing um, coming from me because um, I'm in the thick of it. And so those are our two ways, I think. And then the third thing I would say actually is that what you don't want to do is um, uh, say in the same, you know, 15 minute update, guys, we don't think, you know, contact is important. We're going to roll back cleaning. And by the way, all of you should return to the office today. Um, it, it comes off, I think, as uh, way too heavy handed and I think would make a lot of people very anxious. So your updates about the disease and the knowledge of the disease should be, in a sense, independent updates from this is when we think we'll be returning to the office. So it's just incidentally, we're providing you with educational resources about the disease. And then as a separate thing, you know, let's talk about our plans for the future. Great, thank you. Couple, couple other questions here. Um, can we stop worrying about increasing panel heights and removing soft seating? So more about the environment. Yeah, so in terms of, um, uh, so in terms of panel heights, what I would say here is similar to a prior point. If you are an accounting firm, and I don't know anything about accounting, so apologies in advance if this is a wrong impression, and everybody is running you know, Excel models at their desk quietly and say most people have their own clients, then the addition of a panel um, you know, to protect against aerosol and droplet um, probably doesn't offer much more than a couple percent difference um, in terms of decrease in risk. If you're a call center where everybody is talking and call centers are typically fairly dense environments as well and fairly loud because you're hearing everybody else talk and you have you know earphones in so you can't hear how loud you yourself are then panels that reduce that volume um, and make a quieter environment um, and because of how much aerosol and droplet is being generated um, actually can be quite helpful um, so I would say, you know, it does depend a little bit on the work environment itself. Great. And, uh, got a couple minutes left here. So I think this will be the last question a little bit different. Um, not so much about the office environment, but just in terms of vaccines, have you heard any evidence of, you know, taking pain medications, Tylenol, or anything else that reduce the effectiveness of the, the vaccine and people should stop taking those types of medications? Or what's your thoughts on that? I have not heard of um, things like Tylenol or Advil reducing the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, if you're on medications that affect your immune system's response, um, I would encourage you, you know, as an example, steroids, immunomodulators, things like that. Um, I would, chemotherapy, I would expect, you know, definitely that's a question that you should discuss with your physician, but something over the counter like Tylenol, to my knowledge, does not um, affect the efficacy of the vaccine. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there again. Um, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your time. This was an extremely informative session. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining. Of course. Thank you all.